And then finally, at the end of the episode nine, I took this away. We finally, after, I mean, nine episodes deep, <laughs> nine hours deep, we finally saw a softer side of MJ. We finally saw a softer MJ. Even with his dad, as much as his dad meant to him, and obviously, you know, they had a great relationship. But it, it Jordan didn't come off as, and I don't mean soft in a weak way, but just he didn't, you didn't see that soft side of him even in his relationship with his dad. You saw, I want to please my dad. You know, when my dad, when we were, you know, my dad's playing with my brother Larry and they're fixing something in the car and I bring him the, you know, his dad told the story, but I bring the wrong, Jordan brings the wrong screwdriver and dad says, get in the house. He, he, want, he, had, he wanted to please his dad. He was glad to be in the presence of his father and hang out with his father when they were adults, both of them adults. But you didn't see that softer side of it. Obviously he was hurt, you know, by the death and everything like that. But even in that, you didn't, they didn't show or you didn't see the softer side. But in his relationship with the security guard, Gus Lett, that's where you saw it. It was nice to see that, you know, when, they, when his wife, Gus Lett's wife told that story that sometimes Jordan, Michael Jordan would call Gus at 2 a.m. in the morning, crying. And Gus would go over there and they'd talk, obviously, about his dad. And when he said this guy became his father figure, that was touching. And that was really, a, that was great to see. I, I won't even put it in these terms, we saw Jordan was human, because we saw that in some of the flaws that he had, you know, with the gambling and, you know, uh, the, the things like that. So we, and even the, the, punching out, you know, Steve Kerr and Will Perdue and all that. So we saw the humanity of him. But this was, we saw that soft side of him that we all have. And um, that was good to see because obviously he's come off, and he is and was, this alpha, ultra alpha male, very demanding, um, a rock, somewhat, e e you know, <laughs> emotionless almost sometimes and uh all about the bottom line and this was good to see that side of him and uh you know this is obviously nowadays you know we we know um men push it but some men still don't get it. it's all right to cry you know it's all right to cry and you saw michael jordan and um that's that was touching that you saw that uh, side of him. I, I like that. Uh, we got to see that. Um, and then, and even, even with the poem at the end of the, the whole show, when he wrote the poem, I wish we could have heard the poem. He, he may not even remember it. Um, obviously they burn it up at the end of the 98 season, but that shows as well that he was just driven to win. And that was how he had to do it to win. He had to be all in. He had to be you know, hardcore and have this rough exterior to win for him. Uh, but you saw there were other sides of it. And uh, the poem he shared with his team at the end showed that as well. Another thing, and, you know, it came out last week after episode seven and eight, there was a report that Scottie Pippen was upset with the way he was portrayed <laughs> in uh, The Last Dance. And, and that's why my next point, my next takeaway is poor Scotty. Poor Scotty. Because obviously Scotty Pippen was a tremendous player. And he has nothing to be ashamed of. But, and I don't think that the last dance went out of its way to make Scotty look bad. In fact, Steve Kerr said, we all love Scotty. He was great. He was I, almost like the anti-Mike. Mike was so hard on him. Scotty was nice to him and they loved him. They didn't go out of their way to make Scotty look bad, but everything they presented, it happened. 
happened. <laughs> it happened. I mean, Scotty did, was upset about his contract and did wait to have surgery right before the 98 season, 97, 98 season, because he was upset about it. He did sign that long seven year, I think it was $18 million contract. Um, and I get it. I think that was good that he did it for his family, but maybe just a little shorter deal, you know, might have been more, uh, would have been wiser. But he did that. Scotty did get the migraine in game seven against Detroit. I mean, they, they did, they're not trying to make him look bad. It happened. And Mike was actually not, you know, they, they say he gave a look kind of, you know, when he said it, but he didn't rip Scotty. He just, it was what it was, you know? And then Scotty, you know, he did stay on the bench against the Knicks in the playoffs because the play wasn't called for him. It was called for Tony Kukos. That happened. He quit on his team. He did quit on his team in that moment. And thankfully, they were able to come back from it, even though they didn't win the series. But that happened. And then this, the back injury. You know, in, in game six against the Jazz, <clears throat> Scotty hit a couple of nice shots in that. Give him credit for going out there and gutting through it. But it came off as another, you know, it makes you wonder, did stress get to Scotty? The migraine hit him in game seven against Detroit. You know, I don't think sitting out when Kukoc got the play call for him was stress related, but it was a stressful situation. And then this with the back. Now he said he got hit and he, and he did, but he'd been hit before. Did that, you know, you wonder, just makes you wonder. And that's why I said, poor Scotty. Scotty was built to be a number two. That's why he was the number two and Jordan was the number one. And it just seemed like in a lot of situations, something came up where Scotty wasn't able to be at his best. Uh, so that poor Scotty, that was, that was my thought. Because he may be, hopefully he's not, but he may really be bothered by the portrayal. Uh, doesn't take away from his greatness. His legacy is pure. His legacy is set. But poor Scotty. That's what I thought. Uh, the next thing was, man, the mid-range jumper is the game-winning shot, the buzzer-beating shot. It's the kill shot. And it is sad that in today's NBA, by many people, it is viewed as the worst shot in basketball. That mid-range shot, either get in the paint, get to the rim, or shoot a three. No, you – and I know it was a different era where they didn't focus on the threes as much. But even today, whether it's Kevin Durant, whether it's Ka Kawhi Leonard, and obviously guys hit threes to win games too, but that mid-range shot, you saw it with Jordan both times when he hit game winners in the finals over Brian Russell. It was a mid-range jack. The pass to Steve Kerr, a mid-range jump shot. The mid-range J, if you want to consistently win games at the end, if you want to consistently hit buzzer beaters, master the mid-range. Because you, you they, the defender that can't know what you're doing. Because if you're driving – he may think he doesn't know if you're going all the way to the rim because when you master the mid-range, you can be going full speed or close to it and stop on a dime and pull up and hit that shot. It's the best shot for game winners because if you go all the way to the rim, you're obviously going to get contested by one, two big guys at the rim. Even today where, you know, they don't have as much congestion in the paint as they used to. But still, you go all the way to the rim, it's going to be a tough shot. So that's a tough one. 
And then you might have trouble getting all the way to the ring. The three, at best, at best, you hitting 40% of them. At best. <clears throat> and it's much less at that, you know, at late game shots for threes, for less than 40%. But at best, you hitting 40% of them. And I don't mean you're going to hit them in, in those moments, but I'm saying just taking that shot in any situation, you're, you're heroic if you hit 40% of those threes. So the mid-range shot, they don't, you, the defense doesn't know what you're doing. You can get them off balance because you might go all the way or you might stop on a dime or you might cross over and switch directions. And then the shot's not as long and you can hit it. I, the mid-range, master the mid-range if you want to be a game-winning you want to kill cats at the end of games when you need a bucket. And I just thought we, we saw that so much with MJ. And like I said, Kevin Durant, as great a shooter as he is from behind the arc, he's a mid-range assassin. And so is Kawhi. I know Kawhi needed a ton of game winners that we think of, but you when they need a bucket, Kawhi's got his spots in the mid-range on the floor that he's getting to, and he's hitting those shots. And so don't give up. Don't throw away the mid-range. Just find the master, you know, to the degree that you can, the three, to work on the three and to shoot a lot of threes. I get it. It's fine to go all the way to the cup and be a great finisher. But master that mid-range. Because, and I'm not saying guys haven't hit threes. Kawhi, Kyrie, obviously, you know, in the, in the finals. You know, Ray Allen, I mean, those are Ray Allen's situation is more, you know, you got you almost got no choice, even though he stepped back, you know, they, you know, you don't think much. But I'm talking about where you got time to make a move, make a couple moves. Don't give up on that mid-range. All right. And then uh this is something else too. And I've even said on television a few times that Jordan clearly pushed off on Brian Russell and that iconic game-winning, series-ending shot in game six. But when you really watch, and obviously I've seen replays, but really watching that, and it wasn't just because Jordan said he didn't push off. It's what, I thought this before Jordan even said that. You could see Jordan's hand was certainly on Russell's like backside, but it wasn't much of a shove. Russell was going that way. His momentum was carrying him. Jordan kind of, he had his hand there, but he kind of just, you know, as he was moving the other way, you know, it looked like he pushed, I'm sure he pushed him a little, but not nearly as much as I thought. And I actually, I've, I've kind of always thought, you know, they should have called that. But when I look back at it tonight and see it, you know, slow motion several times and the way his hand was kind of resting on his hip and he, you know, he moved away, making it look like more of a shove than it was. I think they made the right call. I, I think they made the right call in, to, in being a no call. And obviously it gave us one of the most iconic shots in NBA history. Um, the other, another takeaway at, at the end of their sixth championship, you saw Jordan in the locker room, and he said, they're talking about six. He got six of these, six of these things, six rings. And he said, you can't win until we leave. I don't know if it was until we leave or until we quit or until we stop, whatever. But you can't win until we leave. That's one of the reasons, one of the many, that Jordan's the GOAT. Because once he started winning, once he started winning, it was a wrap for everybody in the world that played basketball. Like no one else would, he said it, no one else could win until he left. No one. I mean, the number, the names, the, the Hall of Famers, the great players he kept from winning, Clyde Drexler, Charles Barkley, Gary Payton, Patrick Ewing, Hakeem Olajuwon. 
uh, uh, Carl Malone, Reggie Miller. No one could eat while Jordan was at the table. No one. And his run of dominance is unlike anything we've seen in sports since the old days. And my partner, Rob Parker, always says it. The reason that the Green Bay Packers in football, the New York Yankees in baseball, the ball in the NBA used to win all the time is because back then before free agency, once you had great players, they weren't going anywhere. They couldn't go anywhere. <clears throat> so if you got a great team, everybody stayed put. You had a bunch of Hall of Famers, everybody stayed put. And so you won year after year after year after year. And the other teams had trouble improving your opponents because they couldn't, there wasn't free agency. They couldn't just go out and get a guy who was a superstar from another team. So you take that era out, and we haven't, we've seen nothing like this. Not in the NFL. I mean, Brady's got his six. And I don't even hold the three losses, six of nine. He got to nine. That's tremendous. I don't hold that against him. But it was a 10-year gap between his two, three Super Bowl runs. You know? Magic won five, went to nine. You know, but they won two in a row at the max. Shaq and Kobe won three you know, in a row, and then split up. Like, his Jordan's run of dominance, unprecedented. Unprecedented because he let no one else eat. No one else. No one else. And that's incredible. And so, and I, some people may bring up Floyd Mayweather's undefeated, but you know, Floyd, wait, other guys ate. Manny Pacquiao was eating. And they didn't fight till you know, they were both well up past their prime. Other guys were there, you know. But Jordan let no one else win until he was done. Um, also, and I said this in the first episode, but I want to, it, it's worth repeating now. Another takeaway. It's just such a shame that this dynasty ended the way it did. And it was enlightening that Phil Jackson said that Jerry Reinsdorf gave him the opportunity to come back. And he obviously chose not to. He said it wouldn't be fair to Jerry Krause. Now, it, was, it wasn't a full opportunity because they were going to make him rebuild. And Jerry Reinsdorf talking about we would have built something in the next few years around Michael. No. It shouldn't have been a rebuild. It should have been a reload, if anything. And Michael, I think he probably was right. Now, Scotty, I mean, would they have paid Scotty? They should have paid Scotty. They should have paid Scotty. And I, I just, it's a shame. I think Dynasty should end one of two ways. Either you get beat on the court or you guys are also old that you just retire as the champions you you disband yourselves not not the players disband one guy steps down michael jordan decides i'm stepping down i'm done i'm old i'm done or pippen or something like that but not the front office so it was a shame the way that dynasty ended and uh that was really um, I liked it, Jordan. I thought in the grant, he was asked a question, but the word maddening is right on the money. He says, I think we could have won seven. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think they would have beat San Antonio. I know San Antonio had the twin towers of Duncan and Robinson, but I believe that Michael Jordan and the Bulls, had they come back intact, could have beaten those San Antonio Spurs. And then, of course, the next year, that's when Kobe and Shaq took over. <laughs> Man, 
I think Jordan still would have been great at that point. Now, they would have probably – Pippen, what would he have been like? His back was bothering him and stuff. But they would have had to bring in some new players by that point. Uh, you wonder, could Rodman still have been – how effective would he still have been? Could they even have taken – you know, handled his shenanigans? Um, but Jordan, when he came back at 40 a few years later, after Kobe and Shaq started doing their thing, uh, he still was at 38, 39, and 40. He still was a legitimate all-star after three, four years away, five years away, whatever it was. He still was a legitimate all-star. And so I think had he kept playing, new challenges, Kobe's coming. That Laker kid's coming, you know, with Shaq. Shaq's coming, you know. So I think those challenges would have driven him. It's a shame we didn't get to see those Titans face up on the court. 